Well, thank you. Uh, it's great to be here. I apologize uh, uh, for having to reschedule. I was scheduled here for Thursday night um, and had a, uh, and I'll tell a quick little story about it. I, uh, I travel and I, I uh, actually through my teaching and through some consulting that I do, political consulting, I travel around the world and consulting campaigns. Um, but I had never been to Brazil. And so we ordered a, a ticket. And I got to the airport, and the uh, uh, individual behind the counter at American Airlines said, where's your visa for uh, Brazil? And I said, I don't believe I need one. And, and the ticket agent said, yes, you do. Um, so uh, we scrambled. I, uh, apparently, there are only 11 nations on Earth that you need a visa uh, uh, and, and Brazil is one, and I understand it's because America, I think, screwed this up, and there, there's a reciprocity, and, and America needs to get its act together. Uh, but uh, so uh, I'm in Rapid City, South Dakota, in the western part of the United States, stuck at an airport. Uh, and they wouldn't even let me leave Rapid City because my destination was Sao Paulo, and so it was, you can't get on any plane with this ticket. Um, so uh, with Roberta's uh, help, we scrambled uh, and we changed my ticket. I flew into Houston. There's only six Brazilian consulates in the United States. One of them is in Houston, Texas. So I flew into Houston. The idea was I could walk into the consulate's office and apply same day to try to get a ticket to fly out later that afternoon. The consulate is only open from 9 in the morning until noon. So it's a three-hour window. So I get a cab at the hotel. I'm not from Houston. Um, I don't know my way around. The consulate is 2.2 miles from my hotel, 2.2 miles. I get in a cab at, at uh, 8 o'clock in the morning and say, I need to be at the consulate, which should be five minutes away, right? It's 2.2 miles. I need to be there by 9, but I wanted to get there early in case there was a line. So the cab driver gets lost. I don't get to the consulate. This was eight, eight, little after 8 that I got into cab. I don't get to the consulate till almost 10.30. And I'm telling this individual, it's only 2.2 miles. I don't know where you're going, but it's wrong. Uh, and I need to get there because I have to have this finished by 12 o'clock. Uh, so now I'm there at 10.30. I have an hour and a half. So I come uh, uh, to the counter. And um, first of all, I see a sign on the wall that says, the Brazilian consulate in Houston, Texas, will only give visas to Americans from certain states. Well, the list of states uh, that they that they would give a visa wasn't mine. wasn't one of them. <laughs> so I'm thinking, uh oh, <laughs> I'm in the wrong place already. So uh, so I go up to the counter, and the woman says, uh, uh, "Do you have an appointment?" I didn't know that I needed an appointment. Uh, <laughs> So I said, well, no, but I kind of do. They were, there were some phone calls made from Brazil, and, and, uh, and she says, well, I, I can't see you. And I said, I, I apologize. It's my mistake, but I really need to get to Brazil. There's a conference on sustainability and on bettering uh, government, and, uh, uh, and I'm supposed to speak at it. And I, I think it's cutting edge, and I really need to do this. I think it's important for the Brazilian government and, frankly, for the world. Well, she's hearing this, and she says, well, it's too bad you don't have an appointment. Well, there's a gentleman sitting next to her who, sa who hears this, and he says, well, let me, just a minute. So I show him the agenda. I had a letter um, outlining what I was doing in Brazil. And he looks at it, and he says, well, let me see what I can do. He said, you need to get a, a, an American money order from the U.S. Post Office for $160, and you need to get a photograph for the visa. I said, okay, where do, are they in the building here? Where do I do it? And he said, no, no, they're not in the building. The post office is a half hour this way. The Photoshop is a half hour that way. That's the good news. The bad news is you have to get your $160 money order a half hour that way, your photo a half hour that way. You have to get it in one hour and be back here, or the doors will close. So I'm thinking, well, this is not possible. Uh, there's a gentleman behind me whose wife is a Brazilian, and she was renewing her visa. So he taps me in the shoulder and he says, I've got to go to the post office to get my wife a money order. I know Houston. I'll take you. 
So being desperate, I jump in a car with a stranger that I've never met, um, and we go to the post office and go to the get the photo and literally walk through the doors at the Brazilian consulate two minutes before they close. Um, so then I fill out the, the visa application, and I take it to the counter to this wonderful gentleman, and uh, he signs it. And as I'm thanking him profusely, he grabs my arm and he says, you know why we're doing this? And I said, uh, what do you mean? And he said, you need to be in Brazil. He said, I'm Brazilian, I love my country, but I don't think the government's functioning the way it should. There's too much corruption, there's not enough accountability, um, there's not enough leadership, essentially. And he said, I looked over your papers for the conference that you're attending, that's an important conference, you need to be there. So. I certainly believe that under any other scenario, had I handed him any other paper, I would still be in Houston, Texas or somewhere, but I would not be here. I begin with that in part because what I want to talk about today is leadership, uh, is the idea that I believe, um, le I don't believe, well, I'll put it in the, in the converse, I don't believe leaders are born. I believe individuals have leadership qualities but leadership is something that you develop through, uh, through time, through life's experiences. Um, sometimes leadership is developed when a light bulb goes off in your head that says, I've never thought about leadership. When I was 22 years old and in law school and then later in a master's and PhD program, I didn't think about leadership ever. I thought about making a living. I thought about when can I get out of here? <laughs> You know, I, want to, I want school to be over, and I want to go on with my life. But I never had any teacher, any uh, workshop, anybody say, stop a minute. You're at a point in your life, Steve, where you're about to make a life decision. You're about to determine, are you going to practice law? Are you going to, what are you going to do with your master's PhD? Are you going to teach? What are you going to do? And I was making those decisions, frankly, in a vacuum. Making those decisions thinking, well, every, I, I want to make money. I grew up poor. I was the youngest of eight children. My father died when I was four months old, and mom raised eight kids alone. We didn't have a lot of money. We didn't have a lot of wherewithal. So for me, it wasn't so much the material goods. It was the opportunity, frankly, to break out of this little town in, in, uh, that I lived in and grew up in, and I needed the education to do that. But part of that was education meant opportunity, which, frankly, meant money. And yet, there was a part of me that, and, and I think in my case, um, uh, we grew up Catholic, um, and uh, I actually attended seminary. My mo uh, we had four boys, four girls of the eight children. I was the youngest of the four boys, and my mother, um, a very devout Catholic, always wanted one of her sons to be a priest. Uh, I attended seminary and almost became a priest. And I remember the day that I left the seminary, I called my mother, the first call I made, I decided to leave. And I said, Mom, I know you're not going to want to hear this, but um, I, 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 I'm not going to stay. I'm not going to become a priest. And she said, why? Do you, I thought you liked it. I said, Mom, I love it. The priests are terrific. The training is terrific. The dilemma is I don't think it's my calling. I don't think it's what I'm supposed to do. And somewhere in my heart and in my spirit and in my soul, it didn't feel right. And I said, the problem is, Mom, if I stay another day, I'll become a priest. And I don't think that's supposed to be my calling. Well, my mother, God love her, uh, said, uh, then you need to go into government. You need to serve. Um, and that, that uh, at a very young age, somewhere in the back of my mind, I had this concept of service. So for me, it wasn't just, you grew up poor, go make money. It was, you grew up poor, but you've been given opportunities, opportunities to, to, to attend seminary, opportunities to get 10 years of college, opportunity to do all these things, that, that somewhere in the back of my mind I thought that you have to give something back, that you've been very fortunate. Um, life did not have to give you these things. Uh, but, but, and I appreciate everybody's different, and yet it would have been nice, I think, at the moment of my education that someone would have said, just stop a minute, Steve, and take a look at your life. You're about to make a life decision. We were talking to the professor earlier. You're about to jump off a cliff toward your life. 
Um, maybe it's making money in law. Maybe it's not that you can't do good things in law. You can't do good things in uh, any walk of life. But you're about to make a decision. Have you stopped before you jump and said, you could be a leader. You can change the world. Those gifts that you've been given, uh, in, in my case, uh, part of, uh, I don't know if this is a gift. You'll, you'll help determine that today. I was not, uh, uh, I was a very shy uh, kid. Uh, in fact, I had a speech uh, problem. I had to go to speech uh, training lessons. I could not articulate certain words. My muscles in my, in my uh, jaw uh, didn't allow me to speak very well. And so I went to years of, of training. Um, and, uh, and I was nervous about it because of that. Um, kids would make fun of me because of the way I sounded. And, and that was always in the back of my mind. Well, all of this, though, coalesced, in my case, by saying I've been very fortunate. Um, and leadership to me is giving back. Um, leadership is different than all of you will be successful. I have no doubt about that. I tell that to my students at Harvard. I have about 150 students in my two classes, 150 in each class, about half of them international students all over the world. And I look at them and I say, you, you're not here by accident. You, you're not here because you won a lottery. And so oh, I drew the winning ticket so I get to go to Harvard. You're here because you have gifts. The students in this room are here because you have gifts, or you wouldn't be here. So let's not kid ourselves. That's, it's a daunting responsibility, frankly, because what that suggests is you've been given something that, that literally millions and indeed the vast majority of your, of your peers have not been given. Gifts to come to a great university. Gifts to say, I can sit in a classroom and hear a Harvard professor who may or may not know what he's talking about. You decide. But there's something, there is, there is something powerful in that idea. And so what, what, what I would ask, and I tell my students, just stop before you make your decision. And at, at, at the Kennedy School at Harvard, I have law students in there. The, the law school sends students over. I have people from military academies come in. I have people from uh, MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, that, that cross uh, register. Uh, I have people from the business school. So from all disciplines. And I look at them all the same. And I say, before you jump off the cliff, do you have a responsibility to give something back? My mother used to tell, tell us the story, and I've, repeat, I've, I've told this story. Uh, she, she would say to, to all eight of the kids, your life is going to be difficult. It just is. You're going to experience sickness. You're going to experience death. You already have. Your father died. Um, you're going to experience potentially bankruptcy, potentially divorce illness, ch your children could face illness, your spouse, yourself. Those are difficult things. She said, none of those are the worst thing that could happen to you in your life. She said, there's one thing that could happen to you in your life that is worse than all of them. And of course, we say, well, Ma, death, death is pretty bad. You know, how could something be worse than death? Illness, seeing a sick child. My mother saw, I saw a brother and sister die. Uh, she saw them, and she never understood why a child should die before a parent. Um, so she had a lot of curveballs thrown to her in life, a lot of tough situations. She still contended one thing was worse than all that. And she said, it's this thing. On the last day that you breathe air on this earth, on the last day that you put your head on that pillow, do not look back and say you did not leave more to this earth than you took away. Do not look back and say, my God, I did not take risk. I did not push myself to the outer limits of my abilities. Because at that moment, and she again was a devout Catholic, she believed in an afterlife. But God love her, she would say, as much as I believe, we don't know. We don't know. This could be it. <laughs> this could be your one shot. Please don't look back and say, God, I'm dying tonight. And I didn't reach my potential. I didn't leave more. I didn't help people. I didn't say, I've been given gifts, but I have a responsibility because of those gifts to give back. She said, if you are in that situation and you indeed have to say, I screwed up, I didn't take the risk, she said there would be nothing worse that could happen to you in your life on earth. And she was right. And she was right. That's leadership. Leadership is the ability to say, 
what gifts have I been given and do I have the capacity, do I have the appreciation that I have a responsibility to give back? Yes, I could be a great lawyer. Yes, I could be a great uh, a business person. I could, I could excel in any walk of life. But then it's about me. I tell my students all the time that want to um, uh, get into, in fact, the first couple of weeks of my courses at Harvard, uh, we talk about um, leadership. And essentially, why are you here? If you're getting into politics, and my courses, one of them is a campaign management course, and one of them is a media training course uh, for students to make them better communicators, or to help them become better communicators, um, I'll say, uh, uh, if, if you're only here to better yourself, don't take these courses. I mean, go, I, I, I don't mean that as a slight, but leadership is an attitude. Leadership is a value system. It's a way that you lead your life. And you either believe that that responsibility is important, or you don't. And if you don't, that's okay, um, I guess. I wish you would. But, but I want people here who understand that service is valuable, it's important, that society, whether it's in Brazil or the United States or in Indonesia where I work or in Spain where I teach or any of these areas, that there is this responsibility that comes with service. So how do I do that? Does it, does it matter? Well, the first part is I have to have that mental attitude. I have to have that understanding. Once you arrive at that, the doors kick open. Now you can do anything. Now, understand, public service isn't about uh, uh, the people that serve in elected office. It's, a pe it's about the people who would be served. I mean, Brazil and America and Spain and Indonesia and these places I work, I've got a, a couple clients in Africa, in representative systems. The definition of representative government is that I have a responsibility to represent. It's not about me. People, think of the daunting responsibility placed on an elected official in Brazil. I have to represent potentially millions of people. I'm their vote. Wow. And what happens? You could go to uh, offices, of, uh, of political elected offices in, in Brazil, and you're going to find scores of politicians. You could do it in America. I know literally scores of senators and congressmen. I'm hard-pressed to find one leader. Doesn't mean they're bad people, but leadership is different. I had a, a, a majority leader of the U.S. Senate one time tell me in, in the United States, he said, Steve, and we were talking about leadership, and he said, I agree with you, leadership's important. He said, the problem with leadership is I believe every generation gets one. One leader, an entire generation. And I looked back at him and I said, that's all I need. You don't need everyone to be a leader. Lead, I mean, look at the leaders in, in world history, whether it's Gandhi or Mother Teresa or Abraham Lincoln, and, but name them. They're out there. You don't need every generation has to, but, but somebody in this room, somebody at the conference this weekend, uh, where they had a terrific turnout, about 300 people uh, that are involved and in, 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 uh, want to make a difference in politics, somebody's going to rise up and do that. Um, if you have that in Brazil, by the way, in this very small world, I mean, and it is getting smaller, that, that social network and the capacity to reach out and touch people directly through Facebook and through email and through Twitter and all these different social networks is phenomenally different and it fundamentally changes the way politics will be conducted uh, moving forward. Fundamentally. Because now I don't necessarily have to have the money that often corrupts to move a message. I can move a message virtually for nothing to millions, millions of people. Look at the Arab Spring. Look at the Wall Street movement. Look at the, we're literally toppling governments through Facebook. That is power that we've never had. That, to me, is a good thing, that we can go directly to the people. Leadership says, I need to communicate and get people to rise up, to join a cause, to believe in something. And I believe that as governments get more and more bogged down, and they are, throughout the world. They certainly are in America uh, through the uh, money and politics and the U.S. Supreme Court, the United States Supreme Court in uh, 2010 passed a, a decision, uh, handed down a decision that said corporate money for the first time in American history is perfectly legal and not only is it legal, it can be unlimited. 
I'm capped as an American at $2,500, $2,500 that I can give to a federal candidate. A corporation is not. They can give unlimited money. Um, that is a fundamental change that I think will, America is going to run into that brick wall and going to have to decide what kind of soul it wants. Because that brick wall is buying lobbyists in America today. There's 46,000 registered lobbyists. Ten years ago, there were 16,000. Ten years ago, they spent $25 million a month to lobby Congress. Today, it's $500 million a month. They're buying Congress, and it's going to destroy representative government, I believe, as we know it. So how do you counter that? Leadership. Somebody has to rise up and say enough. Now, it could come from a movement. It could come from in, inside politics. But it will come, and it has to come, but it comes from people in this room. It comes from someone saying, I understand the daunting responsibility. I'm willing to sacrifice. Maybe it's some profits. Maybe it's a lifestyle. Maybe it's whatever. But I'm willing to do that. Now, the, the, the good news about leadership and giving something back is it's very rewarding. It's, it is wonderful to see people light up to say, you've bettered my life. That's, that is a reward, that is a payment you can't get in virtually any other profession. So people that go in and devote their lives to it, um, it, it is where it's happening. And I, and I believe, I genuinely believe that the next world leader, by the way, uh, because leadership knows no boundaries, leadership knows no culture, leadership knows no language, leadership knows no ethnicity, the next great leader of the world could be sitting here today. And the world will look to that leader and look to Brazil as an example. There's no reason that can't be the case and shouldn't be the case. But that's leadership. Leadership, again, is a frame of mind. Leadership is how do you want to change and better the world? I have a responsibility to give back. How am I going to do that? Leadership isn't always easy. You're going to have your critics. You're going to have people that you threaten. Right? Institutions, status quo, uh, they, they like the way things are going because it's, it's doing all right by them. But in a representative system, in a system where whatever your fundamental beliefs, whether it's religious-based, whether it's, uh, uh, there's a morality base, so whatever it is, uh, if you believe that all human beings have certain rights, all human beings have certain liberties, all human beings have certain... Uh, uh, capacity to excel, to have opportunity, and in representative systems, that is the definition after all, um, we're supposed to represent people and give them opportunity. Uh, we're not supposed to oppress them. <laughs> Why would they want a representative system? So, okay, if that's, the, if that's the criteria, are we delivering? Are we living up to that? And if you decide I'm the person who can deliver that, I think again the doors kick open. And the world is watching. The world is watching. I mean, look at, look at the, um, who's the guy, Joseph Kony, uh, the African uh, uh, the mutilator who, who steals kids from their parents and mutilates the kids, and he's been doing it for a generation. There's a movement now, mostly Internet-driven, that says he needs to be taken out, that he needs to either somehow be removed, including death, if that's what it takes. I personally believe that'll probably happen. Not because government acted. Government refused to act for the most part. If you followed that, uh, that, that campaign, if you will, to, to get rid of him, and he's a monster. I mean, he literally has killed, they estimate, I think, 26,000, mostly children. Um, uh, and so there's a movement now that took off in the Internet that says we have to get rid of this guy. He's evil. And my guess is it's going to happen. Think of the power of that. Not one government did a thing. The United States just sent 100 advisors. You know why they sent 100 advisors? Because the movement in the United States over the Internet finally got to the politicians and they said, we've got to do something. And President Obama said, we're going to send some advisors to help train um, Coney's uh, opponents to try to eliminate him. He's, a, he's a, a, literally a, a, uh, uh, a monster of a, a human being. That was Internet driven. You now can talk directly to people like you never could before. This idea that I have to go through and... And one of the things that I heard, I did an interview with a reporter before I, I came to Brazil, and I was talking about leadership and talking about what we were going to uh, discuss at the conference. And he said, Steve, but you need to understand the Brazilian government is very corrupt. 
uh, and he said the people believe it's very corrupt. And it's almost impossible to break through that, that attitude, that mantra that it's corrupt. And I said, I said, no, I think I do understand. I said, to be real clear, most people in America think our government's corrupt too. Uh, in fact, there was just a poll uh, in America a couple weeks ago that government service, the government employment, uh, now ranks last for the first time in American history in, in the history of polling as a profession that people respect. And, and he said, well, isn't that a problem? And I said, no, it's not. Because we have the mechanisms. We have this representative system. We have a constitution that says people have rights. It may be subverted right now. We may have leaders that aren't acting on it. Um, but the mechanism is in place. If we were a totalitarian or a fascist system or something, I'd say, well, that's different. There's not a lot we can do. But Brazil has a mechanism. A lot of countries around the world do, even if they have corrupted leaders. And again, it's, you need one. You need one to come in and say, let's, let's take this thing back and let's give the people the government they deserve, the government they want, uh, the government, frankly, that is, by definition, they should have in a representative system. So the, the concept is, it, it seems fleeting to a lot of people, and it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. I, I, I was mentioning to the professor at Harvard about, um, I guess, eight, nine years ago now, said, we, Harvard has a, uh, they're an arrogant institution, uh, I think somewhat earned, I hope, but they, they believe they turn out world leaders in medicine, in business, in politics, and they were concerned they weren't turning out enough political leaders in the world. And they came to a conclusion, they said, well, I think what happens is we get all these people that look at professions that they, and they're smart people from all over the world, and they say, well, I can leave a mark, but I, I'm at that t tipping point. I'm at the cliff ready to jump off. And they say, well, I could jump off the politics cliff. I could jump off the business, the law, all these different areas. And politics was the one they knew the least about and the one that probably scared them the most. It was most intimidating. Because they said, I don't know. It seems corrupt. I don't know that I want to go there. OK, that might be one reason. Or they say, I'm not sure I have the tools. I'm not a great speaker. Don't you have to be a good speaker? I don't know that I'll go there. Oh, I don't know how to raise funds. I don't know policy. I don't want to be embarrassed, because you have to know all this policy, and I don't know it. And so Harvard made a decision that said, let's create a program that demystifies the political system, that demystifies all this. In other words, Steve, and they brought me in to, to help spearhead this, teach students that it's not that hard to raise money if you have to raise money. To be a good speaker is not that difficult. I mean, again, I, I, I don't know how good a speaker I am, but I, was, I, I used to be really bad. I mean, I, I physically could, not only couldn't do it, but I was, I was nervous. The thought that I could stand out in front of one person, much less thousands, as I've done, would, would have just would have scared me to death. Um, but you find out, and I teach in the media training, little techniques, it's not hard. Okay? Teach them that, they said. Teach them that they don't know to, need to know every nuance about policy. And a dirty little secret in politics, and I tell my students, you need to know a little bit about most everything. You don't need to know a lot about anything when it comes to policy. And think about it. You, your your uh, elected officials in Brazil and the United States, they're not geniuses. They don't know every issue inside and out because they don't have to. That's not what we're talking about. But a lot of people will say, I'm not going to get in because I don't know. So essentially, demystify, take down all these reasons. Uh, or we do one on, on uh, um, skeletons, on do you have something in your past that you're afraid of? Oh, I made a mistake. And we, we literally, they poll this stuff, they test this stuff. There's very few things that would disqualify you from running for office. You think there is, but there's not. And all they're saying is, if we can demystify, and instead of all those really bright students that come to Harvard from all over the world, instead of them just jumping off the business cliff or the law cliff or the medicine cliff or the you know, teaching, let's get more to jump off the political cliff because they have leadership qualities or they would not be here. So if you can demystify and say, it's OK, jump into the political waters, you'll be fine. And we can get more people to do that. We're going to, the odds are, just mathematically, we're going to have more world leaders in politics. And this 15-member section on students that were getting into political courses now jump to 150. They're the largest, um, uh, most uh, demanding courses at the Kennedy School. And what they're finding is 
these students come in after this kind of two-week orientation on let's define leadership, part of what we're doing here, that a light bulb goes off in a lot of their heads and they say, I could do, I, yeah, I'm, I'm okay with that. I think that is honorable. I think that is my responsibility. And so they, they end up saying, yes, teach me. And I'm proud to say I have probably already in, in eight years, probably a half a dozen students that are running uh, for president um, or prime minister in countries that prior to coming to Harvard had no inclination to do so. Now that doesn't mean they're automatically gonna be leaders. It just means the pool got bigger. And when the pool gets bigger, the odds are better, particularly if you have training on leadership. Um, and again, remember I said at the outset, I don't think you're born a, a leader. I think you're born with traits that would play well for a leader. But leadership, I think, is a learned um, trait. It's in part of it through somebody opening your eyes, just saying before you jump off the cliff, take a look at this. Might be for you. Or it's a sum of your life experiences. For me, it was a sum of my life experiences. Grew up poor, had opportunity, had whether it was through the seminary and the, and the priests that, that guided me, whether it was through teachers that guided me. But somewhere, I was grateful enough that said, I really should try to give something back. For me, right now, it's teaching. Whether I'll ever run for office or do something, we'll see, uh, God forbid, <laughs> for the world, that I should ever run for anything. But maybe that's where it'll manifest itself, okay? Right now, it's been very rewarding watching my students step up and go to the next level. So what I want to do, and I don't know if we well, maybe want to take some questions, I don't know how much time we have, but, um, but don't, don't rule yourself out. Don't, don't stop and say, yeah, it's, that's for somebody else. It might be, and that's okay, but at least do yourself the service of saying, I'm going to consider it. I'm going to consider, could I be that leader? Could I be that person that is willing to step up? is willing to give back to such an extent. I, I want to promise you, because I believe this with all my soul, that if you do that, and again, it doesn't mean there aren't other honorable professions, but if you do that, you will look back on your last day uh, uh, on this earth and say, I believe the world is better because I breathed air on it, because I walked upon it. Because there's nothing more honorable for a human being given the gifts that the, that, that the human beings have been given, to say, I've, I left a mark and I bettered humanity. I bettered the planet. I, I looked at the, the, the professor and I were talking uh, before class. I, um, I, I write a weekly uh, uh, online newspaper in the United States. It's a populist newspaper. I write, I edit it. It's small, it's only about 20,000 circulation, but I do a lot of environmental research. and. I'll give you an example, and this is where leaders have to step up, and very normally it's going to be in the political arena. Well, let, so the, 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 the scientists said, what if the Earth temperature due to human activity, the creation of carbon, actually heats differently in different periods? We're at the end of an ice age, so they tested, and what they found was startling, uh, shocking, and sobering. This 2% that we worry about, this 2% tipping point, they found that in an ice age, the Earth's temperature actually increases much more dramatically than the 2% kind of tipping point. It could go as high as 8%. They're predicting 6% by the end of the century. Now, the dilemma with that is, should be obvious. 2% was a tipping point, meaning the world is going to be fundamentally different. 6%, the oceans cannot survive with the 6% increase in Celsius, in the temperature of Celsius. The oceans will die. If the oceans die, we die. So it was this sobering, stunning study that said, oh my God, and we were talking about it earlier, so does that not change the dynamic of leadership or the law? We were talking about in relation to the law. Yes, because now the clock's ticking. I mean, if they're right, and let's hope they're wrong, but I don't know that we can afford to just say, ah, you know, they, they're probably wrong. Well, I can afford because I won't be here, but my kids will and my grandkids will, and I don't want to leave them that world. So now what does leadership mean? Now what does the law mean? Now what does it mean? Because it's different. We, we tend to operate in a society or, or a mindset that says, yeah, life just kind of goes on. This may be the first time since the nuclear threat, uh, not that the nuclear threat's not there, but to the time where we thought a nuclear war could end, uh, end the world instantly. This one is a 
is an environmental nuclear bomb that could be set to go off. And if these scientists are right, it's going to go off pretty quickly. And, and our window to turn this, and some scientists already believe the tipping point has already occurred, that, the, that we can't go back. I'm arrogant enough to believe that the power of the human mind and spirit of, of, of terrific people in Brazil and around the world in America, uh, that we'll figure it out. But the difference today is we're on a clock. And the clock looks like all of a sudden, instead of thinking we had X number of hours, we've got just a little window. Tell me we don't need leadership in that window. Tell me we don't need leadership when leaders around the world are killing their own people. Tell me we don't need leadership when the world population is 7 billion. It'll be 10 billion by 20, uh, 2081. 10 billion, the estimates are that the world can sustain uh, 5 billion people comfortably. Anything over that starts to get tricky. We just topped 7 billion. We're headed to 10 in 70 years. What happens to the world then? Leaders are going to solve those issues, not people that sit idly by in the sidelines. It's out there. Hunger. Look at the, 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 the disease in the world. There are so many issues that leaders need to arise and address. And so I'll, I'll leave you today where I started. You have been given an opportunity. You are not here by accident. You are here because somebody saw in you the ability, someone saw in you the qualities of someone who could excel at the university level. That is a tremendous gift, a tremendous opportunity. I'm here to say, don't stop there. Don't stop there. Don't just jump off the cliff to where you think you need to be at a very young age. Stop and say, can I be the leader that the world needs, that Brazil needs? The more people that do that, the odds are better we're going to find a solution to these problems. If we just lead our lives so that we can make money or find some sort of happiness in material goods or, or whatever it is, and I understand that, it's not enough today. It's not enough today. So someone, please, in this room, um, take that to heart and decide maybe, maybe I've been given those gifts and maybe, indeed, I have to act on the responsibility to be a leader and to give something back to Brazil and to the world because the world desperately needs leaders. Thank you. And if there's time, I'm happy to take questions. Um, if, I, I don't speak Portuguese, so Roberta is my translator. Uh, <laughs> Professor, you could. Uh, I apologize for that. But any questions, I'm happy. Yes. Yeah, first, I'd like to thank you. You talk about opportunities. It's a wonderful opportunity to listen to you. Thank you very much. for it, it, It's a fabulous lecture. I think it's very important. And uh, so it, it got me thinking, right, as good lectures <laughs> usually do. So. Um, I think that what you, what you point out is extremely important, and but it has to do with caring, right? Um, point one, so to be a leader, you have to care. And uh, to be a leader, you have to care for something other than yourself. <laughs> so you have, you have to care for others. It seems to me that right now, this is exactly the problem we're having. Um, people don't seem to care much about anything other than themselves. You mentioned sort of a religious uh, background that would put us in place thinking about other people other than ourselves, even political systems. So, and I think that the representative system we have in politics today had to do with this idea of a common goal, of a common cause, right? And I believe that most people today um, have more a consumeristic um, approach to, to life and political life. I want to get this. I want to get that. It's not a common cause. It's, it's what's good for me. And the second I get what I want, the how with, with, with the collective thing, right? So um, and I wonder whether the current political system, I don't see anyone better than this one. That's, that's, that's what I'm, uh, I'm asking you. I, I, I can see that this is the this representative system we have today for long periods of time, four years, sometimes for senators, eight years, which is totally at odds with the speed things happening in life nowadays for accountability and so on and so forth. If it is still useful um, to express political needs as they play out today? And if not, then what? 
should we move on to sort of direct internet voting on specific issues? Is there is this viable or is this just daydreaming? So uh, my question is that many people don't go into politics today because we've seen we've seen people, good people, full of excellent intentions, time and time again, get into the system and get swallowed by it. And they are not dumb, they are not selfish. They are not, and, and so it seems that maybe, um, maybe this boat has run out. We need we need another thing to, to jump in. But I don't know what. So just just to hear you, to listen to you a little bit more. Okay. Well, uh, great observations, and I, and I think it's it's uh, I think we are at that moment. Um, ha, has the has the boat run out of out of fuel? Um, and and do we need to look at another mode of transportation? Um, I, it, it reminded me as you were talking, and this, this is uh, ongoing, that Winston Churchill once said about the United States, which I think, by the way, gets gets too much credit as a beacon of, of liberty and hope and equality. Um, not that it didn't deserve it at one point, but I think you have to earn that constantly, and I think in the last generation or so we've dropped the ball. But Churchill said at one point um, that America is the worst form of government, save all the others that have been tried and failed. The, the dilemma, I think, to your point is, what if America's system, and, and if America gets credit for the representative system, and it is arguably one of the oldest, uh, um, you know, you, I go, suppose you could start with the glorious uh, revolution in 1688, and, but America clearly was a grand experiment. It's about 240 years old. Uh, what if it's failing? What if it's not working? Um, uh, <laughs> two thoughts. One, uh, and, and, and this is not a cop-out, although, as I say it, it kind of sounds like one. It, 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 I don't expect this all, again, this idea that we just need one leader. I believe if you have the institutional mechanisms, as Brazil does, America does, that leaders can rise up and reinstitute. Um, but it's becoming harder and harder to be leaders in this mechanism that money corrupts and there's so much. So, but, so one, it begs the question, and I think it's a, it, it is the, probably the most oper, uh, uh, opportunistic and operable question, we're asking a system of government to solve these problems we've never seen before, and increasingly it's a system that seems like it can't solve problems. So should we not look another way? The, the second thought, though, is what about this new kind of world, this new way to communicate, this, this movement politics? Um, I personally believe that it's a combination of both, that we're going to have to take the reins of our political institutions and force them to do what they should be doing. But r without an outside force pushing that, uh, in and of itself, on its own, I don't believe it'll happen. To me, it may be the sustainability network. Um, a, a, a group in Brazil that says, we don't like the direction of government with trans it's lack of transparency, the corruption. We don't like the fact that uh, we have serious concerns about the environment and the representative system we have doesn't seem to address them. So there's a movement that says we're going to get potentially millions of people to respond to force politicians. The reason I like movement politics is I firmly believe, and I've believed this doing electoral politics for 36 years now, the one thing that trumps money in politics, money, money will beat everything except one thing, and that's votes. If a politician, a politician could take $100 million to get elected, but if the voter said, I'm going to defeat you because you took $100 million and now you're supporting this agenda that's wrong, that politician, I guarantee you, would buckle in a heartbeat and say, okay, I don't want the money, just get me reelected. So, but movement politics may be where we're at. The danger, and this has happened in America, is that the public is turned off to politics. And when, in a representative system, the public is government. I mean, by definition. I mean, in, in, in America, it is government of, by, and for the people. That's the design. Well, when the people check out and, and don't participate, you got a problem because that creates a void. Who fills a void? Special interest money fills that void. I mean, to give you an idea, in the United States, half of the people who are eligible to vote register. That's it. Half who are eligible don't even register. Half of the people who register vote. So a quarter of the voting age population in the United States determines who their leaders are. I think the, the cynics who don't want government to work selfishly because they can live off the government and get all this money, they want to suppress. They want to convince people government's bad. And I see the same thing in Brazil. I saw it at the conference this weekend where people are very cynical and they say, I just don't, government doesn't work. It's all corrupt here. Well, if that's the case, let's go home. Let's all go home. Let's, let's do as you say. Most people, our inclination is, oh, I made my money. Let's, let's check out. 
Um, let's live the best life we can and let the chips fall. And if there's a, if there's a planet here for our kids uh, 50 years from now, there is. And if there's not, there's nothing I can do about it. Well, uh, okay, that, you know, that could be your end. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly, you know. Uh, uh, and, and, and I don't, I think the world, there are more than Homer Simpsons in the world, and it only takes one, or it only takes a, a couple. Uh, it, it, th there's no great answer except that I think, I think you're right that we should question, absolutely fundamentally question, that this boat has run out of gas, that we have to somehow jumpstart representative democracy and do it a little differently. And maybe it is a litmus test. Maybe it is an outside group that says, we petitioned and we have, you know, 30 uh, million uh, Brazilians saying, if you don't support this agenda, we're going to vote against you. Um, I don't know. I, I, uh, one of my students uh, at Harvard was a director, a movie director. Um, he directed Freakonomics and he directed uh, Capote and a real bright young guy. Uh, he's involved with American Idol. The t I don't know if you, do they have a Brazilian idol or something? America, it's, I've, I've never really watched it, but it's, you get up, I guess, and you, you're supposed to show talent or something. Well, but he, we were talking about it, um, and he said he's very concerned about that representative democracy is not working because people aren't participating. And, and, uh, and he told me he was with American Idol, and I said, what if we did an American Idol to find the next uh, great leader in America? Because um, he said, well, they have 20 million people vote in America for this idol. It is amazing. It's, it's stunning. Um, and, but so we, we're brainstorming this, and, and I said, okay, so if we could get 20 million people to vote for the next great American leader, and the next great American leader, the public said, we want environmental regulation now. We want to make sure that we're going we're gonna to become carbon neutral or whatever. We're going to have national health insurance, which America doesn't have. We're going to have, and now we have 20 million email addresses from people that have voted. So I can go into your congressional district or someone can come into mine and say, Steve, you didn't support this environmental policy or you didn't support national health in, uh, care uh, insurance that would take care of our people. I have 500,000 email addresses from people in your district and we're going to defeat you. We're going to come after you. I guarantee you that politician would, would have tremendous pause <laughs> to say, well, now what was that environmental policy again? Because <laughs> maybe, maybe I am for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you misunderstood. Um, but the point is, that's movement driven. That is not... That didn't come from the confines of, of uh, uh, you know, the representative system or the, or, or the, the definition of, uh, that we know it. So I believe we fundamentally have to change the way our institutions work. I believe that movement politics is going to be the driving force, whether movement is a, a, a billionaire uh, 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 Bill Gates or a billionaire Brazilian who says, I'm going to put money in to change the system, um, and money is needed, um, or it's leaders. I mean, so I hold out hope there's ways we can do it, but I fear the boat has run out of gas, or at least it's, it's running on fumes and something has to change dramatically because it's not working. And when these problems that are out there, I mean, again, we think we've got hunger in the world today. Wait till we have 50 years from now 10 billion people, not seven. Wait till, you know, if global warming experts are right, wait till not only do we have 10 billion people, but half of the earth is not inhabitable. Now what are we going to do? Um, I mean, we, we can't envision the problems that are, that are out there. Um, and yet the clock is ticking and it, the time frame is very short. So th that's why this sense of urgency. And I think it's why Harvard kind of came to this realization a few years ago that we have to change the way we try to move people into government. Because, it, and we had this conversation this weekend, it was very, it was very telling. Should we just have a movement um, and not get involved in politics because everybody that gets involved with politics gets corrupted. The money corrupts. Or do we have to start a new party? Do we have to co-op parties? Do we have to, you know, and that debate's going on all over the world. Part of me says you have to do both. I don't write off, I, I don't think you can defeat government or change it just by being an outside player. That's my own personal belief. I think I want the movement, but I'm not sure that's enough. The, the largest, I, I tell people in the United States all the time, I'll say, what's the largest business in America? What's the largest industry? And they'll say, General Electric, uh, Microsoft. I said, no, not even close. Not even, put them all together. And they don't e equal this one largest corporation in America. It's called the United States government. They've got more money, more capacity to affect change than anybody. We can't ignore it. So I want to capture those institutions. I may have to have outside forces to push them because the boat's running out of water. That's a great question. Anybody else? 
you were talking about leadership, and now you were talking about movement. Um, I have a one question about the institutions we have built for representative government. Um, representative government was, the American experience was, an experiment in representation, but also in aristocracy. The first idea in the Constitution of the United States that, well, people will vote, but we'll have to have an aristocracy that will lead the country. Um, so you have the founding fathers and the other generations. And that was one experiment, so it was aristocracy. And then it became a plutocracy. Uh, it's not the past that lead. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's, it's not the past that lead. It is those who have money. So the best example would be the Obama government, who has kept all the Wall Street people there. He hasn't changed that. And his foreign policy hasn't changed. He promised, well, he used to have troops all over the world, and he can't move that. Uh, so then what did, uh, have we developed in history to, uh, to work with these representative uh, intuitions that they had 300 years ago? I think there were two institutions that still lead, and I want to hear your opinion about that. One is political parties, and political parties became important because of the socialist movement. Uh, uh, political parties became uh, the bearers of um, programs uh, of changes, social changes, and they, were, they had the capacity, that's what they had, to make it a synthesis, a summary of a big national popular democratic project for the nation. That's what they did. Of course, this has been one experiment. I think it's declining. My question is, what's coming next? And the other institution, still very strong, is the media. So I think in the last 100 year, years, what we had was political parties and the media. So if you have two ideas, one political party and a second political party, or three or four ideas, and uh, you have one channel of organizing people. And the same thing is true for the media. You have, uh, in the United States, the large media is basically of one mind. So that's why I think you have difficulties in, or in mobilizing a very diverse civil society, which doesn't have the power to influence in government. If, if you, uh, you know, people do not have that power, even if you see a very uh, lively civil society. Uh, they do not control the parties, and they do not control the media. And still, you, you wouldn't say it's a dead society. It's a very lively civil society. I think the same thing is true in general for basically the Western world. Uh, the East is kind of different. But, so I want to hear you about those two things. Well, an another great question, and 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 I think, uh, uh, unlike a uh, different question, from Professor Hira, but you've you've hit on something that I think is forcing us to look at our institutions differently. Political parties, I think, increasingly are becoming co-opted. Um, I mean, you you talked about the, the socialist movement, perhaps um, reigniting political parties, uh, uh, and I think there's truth to that. Going back in America, the Federalist, Anti-Federalist, at the founding of the country, I mean. Uh, I mean, it, parties aren't mentioned in the United States Constitution, not by accident. They didn't think they need them, and they barely got it out of the blocks, and they decided we need parties because there were interests on both sides, and they, they, had a, uh, they developed a mechanism to, to capture that. I think what's happening, and certainly in the United States, and my guess is as I move around the world now and I see it, what's happening is parties are being co-opted by money. And I don't want to be too much of a one note on that, but, but the reality is the reality. And what's happening is industry, is, as corporations become globalized, it behooves them to influence governments all over. Um, and so they're putting money into governments like they never had before. That is subverting the party, uh, uh, the capacity of a party to rise up because what happens is, uh, in, in the United States, there's a perfect example now after the Citizens United court case. They estimate uh, in 2010, $4 billion was spent on American elections. There are estimates today, and, and the, the, the Supreme Court decision that allowed corporate money to come in came down in January, uh, January 21st of, 
of 2010. So 10 months later, about 15% of the money in the 2010 elections was already corporate money. I mean, they really didn't even know what they were doing, and they were still starting to put it in. They estimate today that the 2012 elections in America will cost somewhere between 8 and $11 billion, and as much as 4 to $7 billion will be corporate money new money that had never been spent before. That is going to fundamentally change the face of American elections. Uh, the, the point of all that to me is that I don't care how good your party is, at the end of the day, you have to have resources theoretically. Now, I have great hope for social media because it's inexpensive and it's a quick reach to millions of people. But it's a dilemma. I mean, it is how do you, how do you trump the money? How do you do that? Um, and, and if you look at corporations in America, they estimate that about 80% of the corporate money that's coming into American politics is going to the Republicans, not to Obama. Um, so he's going to face a battle. I mean, he outspent John McCain in 2008, two to one, 750 million to about 350 million. I talked to Obama's folks uh, uh, a few weeks ago, a pollster of his, it's a friend of mine, he said, we don't think we're going to outspend Mitt Romney. Think of that, a sitting president, Mitt Romney, who... The Republican Party doesn't even, sure, they're not even sure they like him. And he's likely to outspend the President of the United States because they just, the, the corporate money wants Obama out of there. Um, so that's one. Uh, the, the, the media, though, I think, um, and I agree, the media to me was vital as a watchdog institution and as somebody that could, you know, hold the, the, the politicians accountable. Well, what's happening, I think, with globalization of, of uh, uh, not of media markets, but also the corporatization of media, to give you an idea. CBS News in, in the United States was considered the paragon, the beacon of, of fair, honest journalism for decades. Um, well, CBS News got bought by Viacom, who owns corporations that, I mean, CBS News was the smallest part of Viacom. They own Simon & Schuster Publishing. They own just uh, all over the world. It's a worldwide company. And, and, and I'll give you an illustration. Dan Rather, a guy by the name of Dan Rather, used to be the anchor of CBS News. And he had a report during the uh, President Bush's campaign, uh, W. Bush's campaign, that criticized Bush and said he got out of the National Guard under less than honest circumstances. CBS fired him for that. Now, a generation earlier, they wouldn't have fired him. They'd have probably promoted him. <laughs> They'd have given him a pay raise. Rather will contend... Um, that Viacom, uh, that CBS fired him because Viacom was getting pressure from their corporation, their, their global corporate network that said, we don't mind George W. Bush. We kind of like this anti-regulation, anti, uh, you know, no tax. So you've got to get rid of Rather. Um, and they did. Uh, uh, that to me is, I mean, if that's the state, and I will tell you in the United States, I don't know what it is in Brazil, but journalism is, is in tough shape. I mean, everybody's getting laid off. They're, you know. So they're not the watchdog anymore. There's no investigative journalist to speak of in America. The New York Times is about the last bastion, the Washington Post a little bit. They're not there. And you hear that around the world that you just don't see. And, and you know, we are more superficial now. You're talking about let's just kind of survive and be happy. Yeah, we're an entertainment society. Um, but that's a problem um, because we're losing our watchdog, the media. Uh, the political parties, don't, unless they have the cash, uh, they can't compete with the the, the big uh, donors, and it goes to the point here that maybe we have to look at this differently because not too long ago, political parties did have much more power. I mean, in the United States, uh, the, the, uh, in the 1960s, 35% of, of workers in the United States were unionized um, of, of uh, private sector workers. Today, it's 7%. Um, corporations were making all kinds of money in the 60s. Uh, but now, they're breaking. Wages in America have been flat for 30 years. After inflation and taxes, the average American today makes $280 more um, than an American did 30 years ago, even though the American uh, economy has more than doubled in that time. So theoretically, their income should have doubled. It's virtually flat, $280 difference. The top 1% in America now owns 84% of all wealth, 16% um, in the middle class, the bottom 20% own nothing. I mean, you can talk to any economist in America, and they'll say you can't sustain that. Um, I, I, I mean, to give you an, uh, an idea, this is more than, than you might want, but to give you a perspective, in the so-called gilded era in America in the late 1800s, the Rockefellers, the Carnegies, the Mellons, the distribution of wealth was dramatically still different. The rich had money, but the middle class had over 50% of the wealth in America. Today it's 16. So uh, th those trends cannot continue. 
and what, so in a roundabout way. Yes, no, exactly, exactly. So, uh, but I, but, but to now to finally get to maybe an answer or what becomes an answer, I really believe that the public has to rise up. Maybe it's through a political party. In America, maybe it's a third party. In multi-party systems, uh, you know, can you cobble together a coalition that says we're going to stop it? Um, but I think it's a little bit on each front. I do believe you have to have a movement. I do believe that you have to get young people engaged um, because they're the ones that are going to drive this thing ultimately. They're also the consumers, um, which corporations still pay attention to. Um, but it, it is a combination. There's no silver bullet on this one. There's no one solution, it seems to me. Um, but I, and, and I'll, I'll, the, the sad news for me, professors, I don't know how you get the media back. I mean, unless it's through social media that now, and I, I have a lot of, I, I do a lot of media in the United States, and a lot of my friends in the national media hate bloggers. Oh, they're not, you know, there's no monitor on them. And, and I say, there's no monitor on you guys. You guys say what you want. What are you talking about? Um, I just like the fact that there's thousands of them. At least information's being moved because we're not getting information from our mainstream media. I mean, in, in the United States, you get 22 minutes of news on a half-hour news program because eight minutes are commercial. And of that 22 minutes, you might get 60 seconds of politics. And most of it anymore is entertainment, it's sports, it's, you know, health. <laughs> yeah. yeah, whatever. But it's not politics. Well, we're not getting our politics out of mainstream media, so thank God there's this alternative in bloggers and and things like that, uh, web pages, that we can get it. To me, that is our great hope. If you think about it, social media, the internet, uh, web pages, that is, that is the definition of a democratic media. I mean, it is the people talking, right? It's the people participating. Yes, I, I agree, it's not regulated, it's not f filtered or controlled. There's a part of me that says they can be irresponsible as a consequence, but I'm okay with that, because at least they're out there. We, we get no media in the world anymore, not politics. Nobody covers it. So somebody's got it to get particularly young people to say it matters. Um, and right now it's not happening. So I don't hold out great hope. I don't, and maybe the salvation to the media that's, that's dwindling is, is social networking. Political parties, I think political parties have to join with movements and say, okay, you have a movement that's moving. X, for, and I'll use the Joseph Coney again. If, if a political party said, that we're going we're gonna to adopt that position. We're going to get rid of this madman who's killing thousands of children and then move it through the political institutions. But the movement pushed it, right? It wouldn't have happened. We know that. It's been going on for years and years, and finally this Internet movement. W maybe that happens on the environment, that people stand up and say, if you don't support this agenda that will change our environmental policy, we're going to toss you out of office. And maybe a party will adopt it and say, we're going to adopt that agenda. It's probably some combination of that. But we really are. We are at a... You know, you hear this a lot, and I've probably said it, that I believe we are, we are literally at a moment in, in human history, unlike any we've ever seen, that the decisions we make today will literally determine, literally determine whether there's a tomorrow. And I don't know when tomorrow is. Is it 50 years, 100 years? But, but it's not a long clock. And I don't know that there's ever a time, maybe the nuclear period, when, you know, the world was threatened with nuclear annihilation. And, and I say maybe I, I, there was, I, you could argue, was anybody really going to pull that trigger? I don't know. But, but this one is a nature's nuclear bomb. And we better, we better rise up pretty quickly because that, I believe, it's ticking. So no easy answers. I wish there were. Um, but I think it starts with leadership. I think it starts with a spark goes off in somebody's mind that says, I can be that person. Um, and like I say, I've seen it in the few years that I've been teaching this. I have students that are they're going to get elected president and prime minister. They may not be leaders. But they were folks that weren't even in the pool before, and now they're swimming. And let's see if they if they can they can make it work. So we'll see. Anyone else? Thank you. I, I genuinely mean. Uh, uh, let, let me look at all of you. One of you is going to change the world. I believe that. So please do that. You'll do well. It's not difficult. I assure you. I don't know how to do it, but you do. So uh, congratulations. Good luck. Thank you for listening and, and being here. You're kind. And again, I apologize for having to cancel and you're kind to come back. Thank you. Thank you.